Welcome back to PC98 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC98, the most popular Japanese PC series of the early 1990s. Today's game is not from the early 1990s, though I and maybe some of you watching first played it in 1991, when it was released on the NES. Before that, it was released in 1988 in Japan on the Famicom, and before even that, it was released in 1984 on probably just about every PC available in Japan at the time. I'm going to be playing the PC-98 version of the game. But Mr. Jakes, you may say, why aren't you playing this one on PC-88 Paradise? Well, certainly the PC-88 was the more popular machine in 1984, and most 80s PC games were made for it first. But for whatever reason, Hudson decided to release today's game originally for the PC-98. At least if Japanese Wikipedia is to be believed on this. There are zero citations, so who knows. It doesn't really matter though, since both the PC-88 and 98 versions are essentially identical. But anyway, I went out of my way to get the extra rare PC-98 version of the game. So this is going to be by far the oldest game ever featured on PC-98 Paradise. Let's check out the classic, Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom. So what the heck is Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom? It seemed like a weird name even to 11 year old me when I played the NES version. But then again, everyone was already familiar with Princess Toadstool from the Mushroom Kingdom, which was what we called her at the time. I remember mostly enjoying the game. I rented it with my brothers and over a couple of days we managed to get pretty far into it. This is likely the first graphic adventure game that I ever really played, since I don't think I was able to figure out Shadowgate at all. Princess Tomato's cute characters, easy to read text, and catchy music made the game seem very approachable. And by the way, all the music in this video is from the NES game, since the PC-98 version is completely silent. This is a fun little NES game but it definitely isn't the 1984 original. In fact, even the word remake seems almost inadequate to describe just how different it is. There's only one way to show you what I mean, so let's do it. The name of the game in Japanese is Sarada no Kuni no Tomato Hime, which is a pretty close equivalent of the English title. The illustration here really looks to me like an old Japanese picture book, though I don't think the game was primarily targeted at children. The text at the top brags that the game features over 150 illustrations. The case design here is similar to the Nintendo Hudson games that I've shown previously on the channel. Inside we have a survey card and the manual. Fantastic adventure! Inside, it says that this story takes place long before humans stood on two legs, on a faraway planet similar to our own. There, fruits and vegetables lived in peace, under the kind rule of King Onion. But unfortunately in this land, not all produce was treated the same. The fashion magazines were filled with pictures of the slender daikon and cool lettuce, while the ugly pumpkins never seemed to get the girls. So one day, one of King Onion's generals, the Pump King, carried out a coup d'etat, taking the Salad Kingdom under his control. He was a ruthless leader who overtaxed the citizens, causing a rebellion led by King Onion's daughter, Princess Tomato. I see more than a little bit of Star Wars here. So of course next, Princess Tomato is kidnapped by Pump King, who's calling himself Great King Pumpkin now. He demands the unconditional surrender of the rebels, or they can kiss Princess Tomato goodbye. Many rebels have tried to rescue the princess, but none have succeeded. Now a young warrior named Sir Cucumber has arrived at the Salad Kingdom. Can you, Sir Cucumber, manage to save Princess Tomato from the clutches of Great King Pumpkin? Wow, this is a surprisingly detailed story of the politics of the Salad Kingdom. There are three things they have learned never to discuss with people. Religion, politics, and the Great Pumpkin. Near the back of the manual, it says that Hudson will absolutely not give any hints for the game over the phone. But if you want, you can send away for one of the following. A glossary of terms, a hint book, or a list of solutions. In order to get yours, you'll have to send Hudson the triangular proof of purchase from the corner of the game cover, which you can see has been removed from my copy of the game. The game itself is stored on one 640 kilobyte 2DD floppy disk, which was the standard 5-inch format on the PC-98 before 1.2 megabyte 2HD disks. 
So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to use good old Mr. External 5-inch floppy drive for this one. He only supports 1.2 megabyte disks. Or maybe he also supports 640 kilobytes if you get one of these, but let's not get into that. For now, what I have is an internal 5-inch floppy drive. Internal PC98 5-inch floppy drives support all three of these formats, so it should work. I got this drive actually so I could copy PC88 disks on the PC98. Hooking this drive up to this PC98 model is not exactly straightforward. I had to use this fan-made PCB, and this PC98 doesn't have the 12 volt power connector required for 5 inch drives, so I had to use an external power supply. Anyway, I know this is an ugly setup, but it's not likely this drive will be appearing on PC98 Paradise again anytime soon. So let's turn the CPU mode all the way down to the lowest setting, and press power to boot the game. So here's the title screen. Later versions of the game added short melodies that play on the title and ending screens using beep sound, but the PC-98 version is completely silent even here. One of the reasons for that is probably because the PC-98s this was made to be played on weren't capable of changing the pitch of the beep channel. It says to type the word start and press the return key. So let's go ahead and do that to bring up another screen. This is the first game I've covered that draws the graphics line by line. Between each screen transition, you have to wait for the graphics to finish drawing. If we zoom in closely, you can also see these black horizontal lines. These aren't technically what you would call scan lines. The game is just leaving every other line blank in order to improve performance, which was a pretty common practice in early 80s PC games. These lines would have also been visible on a CRT monitor, by the way. I'm actually going to use my favorite utility, ER Cache, to not only further slow down the CPU speed to get it a little closer to period accuracy, but also to double up the lines in the graphics. Purists should rightly be outraged by this. This isn't how the game actually looks. But the black spacing lines just don't tend to look very good on YouTube, especially if you're not watching in full resolution. So sorry I'm gonna go with this. Besides, I already do basically the same thing in every episode of PC-88 Paradise. But I can talk a bit more about that when I get to the PC-88 version later. Another thing you'll notice is the obvious dithering in some of the colors. The PC-98s this was intended to run on could only display 8 colors at a time instead of 16. So here they had to do the best they could with the few colors they had, and just mixed some of them together every other pixel. So how do you actually play the game? Whereas the NES version has a menu-based interface, the original PC game, as you've probably figured out by now, utilizes text commands. However, rather than Japanese, here commands can be entered in English. Type left, right, forward, or back to move. Commands like look, talk, and inventory also work. The manual has some examples of English commands you can use, including more complex commands which are typed in the order verb, direct object, indirect object. So if you want to open the box with the key, you type open box key. A little confusing, but it works. This was the same system Hudson used in their previous minor hit, Disneyland, which yes, is a game that takes place in an amusement park meant to resemble Disneyland. Reportedly, Japanese players needed an English dictionary in order to play that one, and it made for good English practice. However, in Princess Tomato, they also added Japanese input as an option. But it uses the antiquated Kana input system, which takes me forever to use as I hunt and peck, so I'm going to just stick with English commands. We can type save game or load game anytime and choose between 9 save slots, which get saved on the game disk. I definitely don't want to write any data to this original PC-98 version of the game, so of course I used a backup copy for saving and loading. Anyway, this first screen says, you've arrived near Great King Pumpkin's castle town. Can you rescue Princess Tomato and bring her to safety? What will you do? So you can type look, and it says, there's a road stretching forward in front of you. You can type forward to move on, or even just F for short. Hey, all I have to type is Y! On the next screen, we see a cocky, or persimmon, lying on the road in need of help. I like how the game clarifies the English terms for some things in parentheses, so we know what to type. 
Yeah, so rather than an apple or a banana, we've already encountered a fruit that isn't commonly eaten in many countries outside Japan. Have you guys ever eaten a persimmon fruit? At first I found them too hard, but now I kind of like them. Anyway, we need water to save him, and right now all we have in our inventory is an empty canteen, bread, a candle, a sword, and a cassette tape. So let's move along forward. Here we have a fork in the road where we can head toward either the city or a pond. So let's go get some water at the pond. So what do we type here? Take water. No. Use canteen. No. Take water canteen. No. Weird then that the manual uses take in this example, and yet in this game it turns out we always need to use the word get instead. So we type get water canteen to get the water. So now back at the persimmon, what do we type? Give canteen. You can't give the canteen here. Use canteen persimmon. No, you can't use use again. Turns out we just need to type give water. So I tried to talk to the persimmon by typing talk persimmon, but that doesn't work. You actually just type talk. I might have been overthinking this. The persimmon says that he narrowly escaped from Great King Pumpkin's castle with his life, but Princess Tomato is still inside. You can talk to him a total of four times before he starts repeating himself. The most valuable piece of information he gives is the fact that there's a vagrant in town who's actually part of the resistance, and we should meet him. In the NES version, this persimmon is Percy, your sidekick who comes along and assists you throughout the quest. But here in the original, he just gives information and we say goodbye. Bet you weren't expecting that if you played the NES game. And by the way, I just realized that Percy is short for persimmon. How clever! In the Japanese Famicom version, his name is Kakipachi, by the way, which also comes from the Japanese word for persimmon. So in the town, I found the Vagrant, who won't talk, and tons of shops selling items. There's no money in this game. Instead, you need to propose a trade of one of your items for something the shopkeeper is selling. They'll refuse unless you offer something they want, and it's really hard to tell which items you need to buy and which you're going to softlock the game by giving away. At the end of the main street, I found the magistrate's office, where they just kick you out if you try to do anything. This was about the point where I got stuck and just took out a walkthrough. I'm sure it was fun for players in 1984 to take their time and feel the thrill when they figured things out on their own, but I know that I'm going to have more fun with this game today by just playing through it with all the answers in front of me. So at this shop, we need to trade our sword for an umbrella. Wow, the sword is about the last thing I would have thought to give away. And for an umbrella? Then at the electronics shop, we trade our cassette tape for both a D-cell and a C-cell battery, which might be just one of the most 80s trades ever. The shopkeeper says, Oh, Disneyland, I've been wanting to play that one. So it turns out that the tape Sir Cucumber has been carrying was a computer game. And at the tobacco shop, we trade our candle for tobacco. Give the tobacco to the vagrant, and finally he talks. We learn that another one of the rebel leaders is being held inside the magistrate's office. Next, at the bento shop, rather than trading something for a bento, we can get one just by complimenting the shopkeeper by typing pretty. I never would have figured out that you just have to type pretty. So we find a side entrance to the magistrate's office, and a storehouse with a pentagon-shaped block in it called a tegata. Looks like they just kind of gave up on the English translation for that one, and I don't blame them. Inside the side entrance to the magistrate's office, we find the imprisoned rebel, who we can give the bento to by typing give lunch. He teaches us the rebel's secret password, which is G13. The team that made this game were known to be fans of Golgo13, and incorporated him into every one of their games, thus the password G13. Back at the bookshop, we can use this password and the shopkeeper will reveal a secret passageway. It goes to a road outside, which leads to the rebel headquarters. The rebels believe that Sir Cucumber will be the one to save Princess Tomato, and offer him their full support. They tell him that the enemy has a powerful mech called the War Melon. They also have their own mech called the Daikon, but the key to start it was taken by the enemy. That turns out to be the Tegata that we picked up earlier. Now, to travel from here to the second chapter of the game, we go outside into a church nearby. Go inside and... Oh Christ! I bet you didn't think you were going to see a crucified piece of fruit in this game. Man, that's messed up. 
Well, anyway, we have to type pray here in order to open a secret stairway. The stairway just leads outside. That's like the second time a secret passageway in this game led outside. Was the passage really the only way? Couldn't Sir Cucumber have just gone around the church? Or is this secret passage some kind of a wormhole to a completely different location? But anyway, go outside here and the game loads data from the floppy disk for the first time since we booted. That's right, each chapter of the game is loaded completely into RAM and the disk rarely needs to be accessed. In chapter 2, we'll need to find a lightsaber and then the Daikone mech. This mushroom, who has the Hudson B on his head, tells us that in order to start the mech, we'll have to press the cyan colored button and we can get the lightsaber from this hermit by giving him some sake, which hopefully you bought at the liquor store back in chapter 1. But when we give it to him, he's like, Hey, do you have anything to go with this? So where are we going to get this guy some snacks? Well, maybe Peanut Town has some peanuts. Hopefully some edible ones who don't talk. So we come upon this family of peanuts, and what do you guess we have to do to get the peanuts? You'll never guess this one. I was just following along in the walkthrough, and... No way, that's horrible. I had no idea I would be typing that when I started this adventure. YouTube, please don't demonetize me. It's the only way to beat the game. So anyway, he starts to cry peanuts, which we can pick up. I can't believe we had to do that to this family's poor kid just so that this old guy could have something to go with his booze. So we get the stupid lightsaber. Again, totally not ripping off Star Wars, by the way. And nearby we can find the mech in a cave. We set the tegata into this pentagon shaped hole to open the cockpit. Sit down at the console, set the d-cell battery to power it up, press the cyan colored button, and pull the lever to get going. We type stand to stand up and finally we're on the move. Daikon away! Time for the disc to load up chapter 3. Before encountering the enemy mech, Warmelon, we'll want to pick up a rock and a tree on the way. Just keep moving forward, and there he is. Throw the rock and the tree at him, and that's it. He's scrap metal, but our mech has been damaged in the battle too, so Sir Cucumber sits off on foot again. Soon we'll encounter some angry bananas, and this is where we'll need to use the lightsaber. Type set bat 2 saber to put the C-cell battery in the lightsaber. Everyone knows that lightsabers run on C-cell batteries. It's Star Wars canon. Still going. Nothing outlasts the Energizer battery. Type stab banana saber to take out those bananas. And also pick up some of their banana peel for some wacky fun later by typing get rind. Going forward from here, we'll come to a mountain summit where we can stand on the precipice and see Great King Pumpkin's castle below. Go ahead, kid! Jump! So we type jump, but I sure hope you bought the umbrella back in chapter 1 to allow Sir Cucumber to land safely. Maybe don't try this one in real life. Now we're on chapter 4, the final chapter. I'm actually pretty impressed by how long this game is for 1984. We'll find a field in front of the castle that we can hit in order to meet this yam and give him our umbrella in exchange for access to his underground tunnel to the castle bathroom. These early 80s PC graphics can look so funny. Did a kid draw this? Why is the toilet sitting in the middle of the room in front of a pink bathtub? But Sir Cucumber has gotten dirty and will want to use the shower here to clean up. Otherwise he'll leave tracks and get caught by the guards later. Outside the bathroom, we'll see the shadow of a guard nearby. Time to throw that peel from those bananas we slaughtered earlier. Oof, that's gotta hurt. We'll take his key and use it to open the cell door nearby. Inside, we'll meet more captured rebels, including a green pepper standing on his head. He speaks backwards, and here he's saying, or, Hudson Soft is good soft. We can open a pot nearby and meet some Napa cabbage. Give him some water and he gives you a caterpillar, explaining that Great King Pumpkin hates caterpillars. Quit following me! I hate caterpillars! They're all fuzzy! Yeah. Nearby we'll find a stairway and another guard. Here we'll have to wait until the guard falls asleep. You have to type wait seven times. This is even mentioned on Wikipedia for being the most infamously difficult part of the game to figure out. Past the sleeping guard, we'll finally find Princess Tomato. We don't have to do anything here, but if we talk, she thanks Sir Cucumber. Now she can finally be free. 
To the right of her room is the great King Pumpkin himself. All you have to do is show him the caterpillar and he runs off and flies away in a rocket. To the ends of space, it says. Interesting that the villain gets away. Maybe they wanted to keep it open for a sequel, which unfortunately never happened. Anyway, Sir Cucumber is rewarded with a tomato-y kiss. I wish I was surrounded by gorgeous, juicy tomatoes! Give me that! Typing forward twice will advance us to the final screen. Sir Cucumber waves goodbye to everyone in the Salad Kingdom. Even the mech has been fixed. And I guess Sir Cucumber returns to wherever the hell Sir Cucumber is from. The text congratulates you for your hard work and encourages you to mail your opinions about the game to Hudson. The back of the game brags that it was made by the famous Takenaka duo, which is short for Takashi Takebe and Shinichi Nakamoto. Apparently they were somewhat well known in the Japanese PC gaming scene at the time for their previous game, Disneyland. They would later also release their third and final game together, Disney World. Nakamoto would become known as the creator of Bomberman, and would go on to work on far too many Hudson games to name. Takebe would work at Hudson's US division for a short time in the late 80s when they were expanding in the US, and would return to Japan in the early 90s to work on a few more Hudson games. He went on to form his own development company, Rocket Studio, in 1999, which worked on a number of interesting games. It seems the PC-88 version was released four months after the PC-98 version. This was the first version to add little melodies to the title and ending screens, using beep sound. On PC-88, these black lines aren't optional. The system outputs them at all times, even on the BIOS screens. But on PC-88 Paradise, I always use the RetroTank 4K to get rid of them by enabling this option. And for some games you'll also need to enable this one too. There's also a similar option on most PC-88 emulators. Anyway, the PC-88 version is otherwise basically identical to the PC-98 version, except it draws the graphics a little slower. PC-88s at the time were only 4 MHz, while PC-98s were 8. The game was released for a ton of other PCs, and I can show you footage from most of them here. The PC-8000 was a less successful sister series to the PC-88, and the PC-8001 Mark II version of Princess Tomato was released on three cassette tapes, and has terrible sounding beep sound. It's one of the many versions of the game that has less colors to work with. Still, if this was the only computer I owned in the 80s, then I'm sure I would have been happy to have this. Hey, the title screen music in this one actually sounds sorta of good. The PC-6000 series was sort of NEC's budget line of early 80s PCs, and Hudson made a version of Princess Tomato for the 6001 Mark II. This one has even worse color yet. It's very yellow and green. That's all the NEC PCs. With the Fujitsu FM7, we're finally back to a competent 80s PC. This version is graphically equal to the PC-98 or PC-88 versions, and the music sounds okay. And the good old Sharp X1 is a similar story. The Hitachi MBS-1, a more rare 80s Japanese PC, also has quite a competent version of the game. The SMC777 was another fairly competent 8-bit PC released by Sony in 1983. It didn't take off though, and Sony ended up mostly manufacturing MSX machines throughout the 80s, under the same HitBit brand. Anyway, Princess Tomato looks pretty good on this machine. And speaking of MSX, of course there was a version for that as well, which came out the next year. It was on cassette tape, and the graphics were unfortunately in black, or purple and white. Maybe not the best version to play, unless you happen to live in 80s Japan, and your only PC is an MSX. Finally, the Famicom version came out much later, in 1988, and was later translated and released on the NES in 1991. 
As mentioned earlier, this is a really, really different game from the original, utilizing a much easier menu-based system. Not only do you have a sidekick to give you hints as you go along, but there are some first-person tunnels to navigate, and some battles which need to be won by playing rock, paper, scissors. After winning each round, you also have to try to point your finger in the same direction where the loser looks. This was really confusing to 11-year-old me, but as a common variation of rock, paper, scissors everyone is familiar with in Japan. The game is much longer and features only a few parts that are roughly based on the original. Overall, it's a much easier game to play and has aged a lot better than the original in my opinion. There don't seem to be any softlocks in this version. You can't throw away any essential items or anything. But there are still a few parts that are surprisingly hard to figure out without a walkthrough. The localization is overall quite well done and entertaining to read. It's also maybe worth mentioning that the Famicom version can also be played on the Game Boy Advance as part of Hudson Best Collection Volume 4. There were a few different Japanese flip phone versions of the game released by Hudson between 2001 and 2005. Interestingly, rather than a port of the Famicom version, these were an all new version of the game. While the interface is menu based like the Famicom version, it appears more faithful to the original. I really hope this version gets properly preserved at some point for future generations, if it hasn't been already. And in 2017, the Princess Tomato character even made a surprise appearance in Super Bomberman R as a playable DLC character named Princess Tomato Bomber. The original version of Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom is one of those graphic adventures that's a little too old for my personal taste. The things you have to type at many points are far too ambiguous. The game would have likely taken even smart players weeks to figure out without some sort of guide from Hudson or a magazine. With a full walkthrough, it took me about 40 minutes to slowly play through the game, while screwing around a lot and enjoying the artwork. If you only play one version of Princess Tomato, the NES or Famicom version is definitely the way to go, in my honest opinion. But in any case, the original PC versions of Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom are a wacky and fun little part of Hudson's history. Thanks for watching this episode of PC98 Paradise. Here's the current list of my awesome patrons and YouTube members. Check out my Patreon page if you want to learn more. If not, likes and subscriptions are of course appreciated as well. Thanks for watching. This has been Mr. Jakes, and I'll see you in the next one.